Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this timely webinar. The webinar is entitled, There's No Place Like Home, Affordable Housing and Ending Housing Insecurity in the United States. We are pleased to present this webinar as part of the American Bar Association section on civil rights and social justice. And this panel is just one in a series of rapid response webinars presented by the section of civil rights and social justice. We are um, going to, if you would like additional information about additional webinars, please visit the website at AmericanBar.org backslash CRSJ and you can obtain information about all of the webinars being presented by the section. During today's program, we would ask that you submit your questions in the Q&A and not the chat function. We will reserve some time at the end to address questions presented in the Q&A. If you don't see those controls at the bottom of your screen, ensure that your screen is not idle. And again, we'll, we'll address those um, during the, the last few minutes of the program. We are pleased this afternoon to welcome the chair of the section on civil rights and social justice, Angela Scott. And Angela, we invite your welcoming remarks. Thank you, Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. As Janet said, my name is Angela Scott and I'm the chair of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice section. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar titled, There is No Place Like Home, Affordable Housing and Ending Housing Insecurity in the United States. As lawyers, we know that the first step to problem solving is properly identifying issues and analyzing them. The Civil Rights and Social Justice section provides informative programming to think through critical issues with an intent to inform and problem solve. Homelessness and housing insecurity is a problem. Even prior to the global pandemic that we are still in, by the way, homelessness and housing insecurity in the United States were at crisis levels. Add COVID-19 on top of that, where you have people losing their jobs, and unable to pay their rent and mortgages, that problem surpasses crisis levels. Even though there have been emergency benefits, including eviction moratoriums and all kinds of things implemented to assist in keeping people in their homes and safe, we all know that these emergency benefits are temporary. And as more and more Americans get vaccinated, we are beginning to see the light at the end of this pandemic tunnel. So where will that leave people? How will renters catch up on what they owe their landlords? It's important that we get this issue back on your radar and discuss solutions, support services, programs and benefits that are out there to resolve these issues and to hopefully prevent the impending housing emergency that we are likely to soon have on our hands. Again, I want to welcome and thank all of our viewers for tuning in today. And I wanna thank our staff, Paula Shapiro, Ali Kilsgaard, and Ruchika Sharma, and our program organizer, Judge Perkins, our moderator, Janet Green Marbley, and all of our esteemed panelists for participating in what I know will be a very necessary and informative discussion. Janet, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Chair Scott. We are pleased to have um, this afternoon four esteemed panelists to discuss with you the There's No Place Like Home, the Affordable Housing Crisis in the United States and Ending Housing Insecurity. Our first panelist is Anthony I. Butler. Mr. Butler is the president and CEO of AIDS Interfaith Residential Services, Inc. and Empire Homes of Maryland. Our next panelist is Josephine A. McNeil. 
Josephine is the retired executive director of Citizens for Affordable Housing in Newton Development Organization. Sarah Nutt is our next panelist. She is an individual giving associate, former associate board member, and volunteer with Sarah Circle in Chicago, Illinois. And finally, we have Adrienne Tynes. Adrienne is a housing advocate and she lives in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Let's begin today's discussion with Adrian. Adrian joins us um, as one who has personally experienced homelessness and the affordable housing crisis in the United States. She has graciously agreed to share with us her experience and we thank her for that. Adrian. You're on mute, Adrian. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, all right, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to first open it up and talk about that there is a, a, a need for universal vouchers. And um, in my particular situation, I ended up becoming homeless um, because I fled from an abusive ex-husband who's a medical doctor that's well-connected. Um, on my journey, um, I ended up going in and out of uh, safe houses um, and ended up going in and out of shelters to protect myself and the children. Uh, along the way, CPS um, basically took advantage of my situation, uh, my homelessness, and used it against me, ignoring the evidence that we had. Um, the system normally, um, when you go into the system to try to get housed, you fall under uh, certain categories, get into different programs. One of the main programs that uh, a staff member was telling me where they get the most funding from is if you claim you're mentally ill. A lot of people start uh, trying to claim that they were mentally ill just to have a place to stay. Now, if you didn't do that, then you started getting pressured into stating that, um, that you're mentally ill um, in order to get into some type of housing program if you didn't fall up underneath uh, a program of being mentally ill or chronically homeless, and they have other categories as well. Um, some of the issues that I had found when I went into these places, the shelters that I went into even with my children, um, is, is inhumane conditions uh, where people, you know, it's, uh, they really don't want to be in these places because you're, you're met with uh, drug drug addicted people. If you're not on drugs, you know they're mixed mixed people together. They mix you with prisoners, mm -hmm. and you have women in these facilities. Um, they um, you you're you, you're in a situation where you have to, in a lot of cases, sleep with uh, you know just the community that's right there, that's from off the street and in uh, one big room, which is not safe for you know if you have children or women when you're coming into these places. Um, we've, I've uh, seen mold, asbestos, raw sewage, uh, poor food quality, food, people getting food poisoned, uh, staff abusing people, um, staff committing fraud, bed bugs, you name it. Uh, people becoming sick because it's uh, like the, the boiler or the furnace system is not um, up to cold. And then if you complain about anything, the staff is untrained. A lot of them come from the streets or from prison and they, um, they abuse you, you know, and they basically threaten to put you out or have some of the other people in the facilities that's come from the streets uh, to attack you. So these issues that are going on, um, they need to really have, um, like an outside um, agency over these nonprofits to address a lot of these problems going on. Because when you go to the higher ups, they protect their staff members and they cover up everything. Um, I was personally put out of a, a shelter, a couple of them, because I spoke up for the people. And I tried to get the people to stand up and make certain complaints. They became petrified and they were saying that, look, if I'm put in the streets, you know, I have health issues. I met people that um, had shared with me, people had froze to death because they were 
uh, made to leave the shelter every day um, and stay out for all day. Um, this is just ridiculous what's going on. And even if you ask, well, hey, can I have a copy of what I'm signing? You're told no, because you're treated in a demeaning, disrespectful manner when you go into these shelters. And um, the, the thing of it is, is that uh, there was several women that came to me that had got sexually harassed and abused by male staff members. Uh, as I tried to go forth and advocate for them, then I became the target. And then I was put out of these places along with these women who were put out of these facilities. I had spoke to personally the mayor in Detroit, Michigan, Mayor Duggan, two years ago uh, about these issues, even staff still in donations, still in what's supposed to go for the homeless people. And um, just basically, they um, uh, when I shared it with Mayor Duggan, um, he, he behaved like he was surprised at what was going on in these facilities, but no change happened. Uh, the director that had put myself and two other gentlemen um, out uh, what was it, two months ago, he's still operating as a director there. He's a former ex-gang member, uh, been in prison, um, and he was telling the people that they either couldn't come back in, people who have health conditions in their 50s and up. Um, and I called Congresswoman Tlaib's office uh, because she was a part of the organization Detroit Action that I worked with, and she, their, her staff contacted the board. When the information got back to the guy, the director, he knew that I was the one to put the complaint in. He ended up putting me out in the streets where I had to sleep in a, a, a vehicle for uh, over a month. And it, it's just ridiculous with how p homeless people get treated as if they're nobody, you know, and people do have rights. They shouldn't be allowed to get treated in this manner with the way that they're doing people. Um, I had suggested also uh, to Mayor Duggan about how well, um, in these homeless shelters, you need up-to-date resources. Uh, they tend to uh, rush you into finding housing within a month or two, and you end up getting into areas that are not safe or some landlords will put you right back into the shelter system. So um, I had asked Mayor Duggan, could they um, you know, create like a transportation system to help the homeless people to take care of their business, to go back and forth, um, to address, you know, any type of um, issues that need to get addressed. Like in Detroit, we have what's called a CAM system. I believe it's called a coordinated assessment model where you call there to see if you can get a spot in to get into a shelter. If they tell you, no, they have no spots, then the person is on the street. Um, and then they tell you, you have to come there every day. And sometimes I see women with two, three, four children don't have the ability to get there every day. And then just to get told, oh, we have no openings for them at all. So it becomes uh, very, you know, um, just difficult for even just to take care of simple um, issues just to try to find out if you can get housed or not um, and get into a shelter. Uh, when we're asked, can we, like I stated, uh, if we can get copies of what we signed? No, you cannot get it. I've never heard of that. You know, and then I challenge it. And again, I become the target. I become the troublemaker. They call around to different places and say, okay, don't let her in here when all I'm trying to do is address the issues to make it work better, you know, for the people. And, and Adrian, um, we are um, very appreciative of the fact that in spite of what you've been through and gone through, you still make attempts to advocate Oh, yes. for the homeless and to help those who are in the situation that you were once in. Mm -hmm. We think that is commendable. I know that there are numerous organizations that seek donations for the homeless and there are volunteers in shelter, homeless shelters, but this information never comes out. Mm -hmm. What kinds of services um, can or should be available to individuals such as Adrian? And what kinds of organizations exist so that when there are people who make donations or volunteer, 
they can be assured that their donation is actually going to help the homeless and they can be at least assured that there are programs to protect those who find themselves in that situation. Are there programs that, that not only women in Adrian's situation, but the homeless generally can turn to um, for assistance with this? I know Chicago with Sarah Circle um, is such an organization. And Sarah, what, what happens or what, how do organizations such as yours address the issues that Adrienne was faced with when she found herself in a homeless shelter? So we, um, we try to introduce um, clients, the women we serve to case management so that they can be uh, introduced to specifically ta tailored services for their needs. Um, of course, it's not a perfect process because every individual is so unique and has a different story. Um, but having a case manager paired to them, hopefully we can find some solutions to what has led them to homelessness. Um, what is the role of the case manager? Case manager um, can help prepare them for job interviews, can get the uh, housing process started, can he essentially hear what they need and then direct them to whichever service they need from Sarah Circle. So we have our daytime support center, which is um, a place where they can go and get a hot meal. Um, they have access to computers and internet, printers, um, laundry showers, and um, employment services. They can go to interim housing, which uh, is really excellent. It's a 24 hour shelter, uh, which gives the stability of home. So most emergency shelters is it's like your, that bed isn't guaranteed. And um, to have to spend your whole day trying to figure out where you're gonna sleep that night is, it, it takes so much energy um, from the women that we serve and women like Adrian. Right. So, um, you know, interim housing, they have a secured bed and they can count on that um, and they have meals and they have showers and employment services and all of that. And the goal is to get them set up with permanent housing. Uh, and then we have our permanent supportive housing, uh, which helps, you know, disabled women and chronically homeless women. Um, in fact, we were very fortunate in the end of 2020 um, to be able to open our um, Sarah's on Sheridan, which is a new housing facility. And it houses 38 permanent supportive housing clients. And we have on the horizon Sarah's on Lakeside, which will open, uh, I believe, at the end of 2022. Uh, or 2023, I'm not entirely sure right now, but that will offer 28 units of permanent supportive housing. Um, so we're very fortunate to be able to offer that. So if there in fact is a housing crisis, an affordable housing crisis in the United States, and um, that means that I'm assuming that even if someone in Adrian's situation was able to get into one of the temporary housing programs you described, then how do they take the next step to finding a permanent home and something they can afford and something that's gonna provide some stability to um, a family such as Adrian's, what, what's out there um, for them? Um, I, I'm assuming that the Citizens for Affordable Housing, Josephine, that you were associated with for many, many years um, might be able to provide some services to an individual like that, but, but what how do you determine what is affordable housing for a homeless person? Well, thank you um, for, for the question, um, Janet. Adrian, thank you for your, your story. Um, 
affordability is not really in a, based on whether you're homeless or not homeless. Um, the government defines um, or establishes the the what's called fair market rents, and then from fair market rents they um, establish income and rent li limits based upon actually on program uh, where the, the resources are for the particular program. Most in my community in Newton, Massachusetts, um, we did uh, provided much of our housing um, for development and for tenant assistance from a program called the Home Program. And the Home Program exists in um, states and in counties and in uh, metropolitan areas throughout the country. And depending upon which area you live in, um, that uh, defines what the income limits are. The, um, the Home Program is unique in that it establishes specific um, targets and uh, limits for income as well as, well as rents. But in any event, um, no one can pay more than 30% of their income um, for rent. Um, I took the, took the opportunity to look at um, what the income limits were for the areas from which the, the panelists um, uh, live or their, the housing programs they work with. Um, so in Chicago, um, the income limit for a fam a two two um, person family um, is thirty seven thousand three hundred dollars. In Baltimore, and I wasn't quite sure, Anthony, if we if you were in Baltimore or what part we are in Maryland, is forty two thousand fifty dollars. In Detroit, it's thirty two thousand dollars, and in Massachusetts, where um, I am, it's $38,900. So you can see that if you're talking about this particular program, the, the difference um, in the rents. And I have to say, I was surprised that Baltimore's um, very low um, income limit was as higher than the Boston area, which sort of, you know, when you hear about income and limits, you, you hear about the East Coast and, and the West Coast. And I know um, Baltimore is the East Coast, but I guess I'm, I'm uh, from New York and then Massachusetts. So I sort of tend to go, to go North. But the point I'm making is that when you're talking about affordability, um, the range is, is uh, completely different. And I know Anthony works with other programs like the low income housing tax credit programs where the, the uh, income limits and the percentages are, are completely different. So, um, so that it's, it's how it, 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 the impacts, um, you know, in terms of your question about affordability, the, where someone lives will determine what, what is affordable and what they can afford, afford. And it becomes even more complicated because depending upon the program, the, those limits change. So, um, Anthony and, and Josephine, I know you work, um, as well as Sarah, with lots of different programs, with lots of different guidelines. Based on what we've heard about Adrian's situation, how could you help her? Or could you? Could you help her find a home and a, a roof over her head for herself and her children? what exists, um, notwithstanding location, what exists to help a person in Adrian's situation? Right, I, I think, well, first, thank you all for again for having me. Thank you, Chair Scott and, and just Perkins for uh, allowing me to participate in the panel. I really do appreciate uh, being on such an illustrious panel uh, with uh, my colleagues here. Uh, and thank you, Adrian, for sharing your experience. And unfortunately, um, your experience is not unique, it's unique to you, and I know um, that's important, but um, I'm sure Sarah can say the same thing, and, and Josephine, that we see those stories repeatedly uh, throughout our work. Um, and unfortunately, it's a combination of problems 
or, or lack of resources that will prolong um, uh, someone being in a shelter like that. So there's the, uh, the first one is just the lack of, per the call of our panel today, just the lack of affordable housing. So even if uh, we have the funds and the grants to, to provide the subsidy, sometimes it's, it's really just the ability of finding either, uh, if, if you're talking about rental subsidies, landlords who want to participate in the program, uh, and then B, if you're looking at home ownership, uh, being able to find those, uh, in the, depending on your market, so just like uh, the, the what we consider to be affordable is going to vary by geography, so will the housing inventory as well. And so when you look at all of those factors, um, you can be, uh, and I'm sure Adrian, she didn't say it, but I'll say it for probably feel stuck uh, in a system that doesn't, even though you meet the qualifications, you really don't have a, a clear path out. Um, and that's because there is uh, so much variety in, in the types of funding. So um, even just on what we consider to be homeless, for example, in Adrian's situation, she qualified for what we call Category 4. If you're fleeing domestic violence, you're automatically considered homeless. Um, if you're not working in this space, most people wouldn't think of that when we count uh, uh, domestic violence survivors as, uh, as part of the homeless population, but we do. Um, you also have, there, and that's four of four categories, or three other categories as well. So uh, there are as many uh, programs for people with variety of issues, uh, and Adrian was spot on, mental health is one of them, uh, other disabilities. Our organization, uh, hence the name, AIDS Interfaith Residential Services, Inc., uh, we provide housing for people living with HIV or AIDS. Uh, we've expanded it to other disabilities. We've expanded it to, to young uh, adults, uh, we call them transition age youth between the ages of 18 and 24, which fits another definition of homelessness. So um, the, the, the challenge for uh, citizens like Adrian and people who we want to help and our neighbors uh, is where is trying to navigate where you fit into one of those categories and if there is a subsidy or a program that's targeted for that group. Uh, and so that's the, the challenge, and that's what organizations and case managers like ours and like Sarah's, that you know, we really try, and, and that team tries to identify what resources are available to help put uh, the best plan together, the best plan forward, so that people aren't re-traumatized. They, they, they don't find themselves back in a situation uh, where they are really thinking about where they're going to sleep that night and how they're going to take care of their children. Uh, because of the variety of programs and, uh, and qualifications for each one. So it really is, it varies per jurisdiction. It, it varies because um, you have federal dollars, you have state dollars, you have local dollars, or all different funding sources. Everyone has their own objective. They have their own wish list of who they want to help. And so you really got to find, a, you know, find the program that best fits the, the, the space you're in at the time. Um, I, you know, tongue in cheek say most times if you are a, a in your late 20s and you are completely healthy and you're not a veteran, there's not a lot out there for you. Um, there really isn't a, a lot of resources because this it's not one of the uh, that category of people, so to speak. If you don't have a disability, if you're not um, don't have a, a mental health issue, um, if you're not a veteran, and, and you are not considered a transition age youth because you're too old, you're over 25 and you're not a senior yet because you're not 50 or 55 or 65, depending on the program, there really isn't a, a lot out there for you. And so it becomes challenging for organizations like ours and Josephine's and, and Sarah's to really find resources for that place. They're out there, but they're not as popular as, again, as Adrian pointed out, um, that you know, if there's certain things, if you have a mental health is issue, you probably can find resources. If you are suffering or if you're surviving domestic violence, you probably can find some resources for you. But if you don't have those, uh, you don't check certain boxes, it really is difficult. And that's, there's no real national program or, uh, or strategy for that. So uh, as we, you know, if I can, can, can say anything to our, our, our listeners today, that if you have any uh, influence or power, then maybe that's a, a place where we can focus some of our energies on addressing these issues and how do we, uh, A, increase the inventory of affordable housing, because uh, you have jurisdictions like Washington, D.C., which is 30 minutes south of me, they have plenty of funding but no inventory because none of it's considered affordable. Everybody wants their, you know, their, their nice loft and, and condo. So they have plenty of resources, but there's no place to, to actually uh, to, to acquire because none, they're not, uh, the market doesn't bear that. Um, if you're in the real estate development uh, industry, 
you're not going to carve out a piece for affordable housing in a market like D.C. because you can get premium dollars for that space. Unlike Baltimore, we have plenty of inventory, but not the funding we need to put everybody in a, a, a situation where they have healthy, clean, uh, reasonable, and affordable housing. So, Adrian, um, if you don't mind uh, sharing this, how have you been able to keep a roof over your head for you and your children? Um, well, my children, they're, they're older now and they have their own, but um, I was able to keep a roof over my head just by going like to different shelters or to um, um, friends or family members off and on. But the problem is that they try to keep tell you if you want to get housed, you know, it's best to come into a shelter. And like I stated, in these shelters, they the, the resources there, they don't offer the uh, you know proper resources to the people as they state that they do. And um, it, it's a struggle. It breaks you down after a certain period of time. And I had spoke to one case manager two years ago. She told me, she said, the system is designed to keep people dependent on it. And, um, I, I, you know, like I stated, I've seen people um, commit suicide because they can't uh, find housing. And this really uh, bothers me, you know, that there, it's really, to me, a moral issue. Like we were talking to uh, Councilwoman Sheffield in Detroit um, two years ago. It's really a moral issue. The, the, the problem is not really all that complicated if people really... Um, have the right mindset to, to get together and to do the right thing. You have a lot of homes. When I was in a meeting with Congresswoman Tlaib two years ago, one of the ladies that was there, she said, do you know they have enough housing uh, homes out here in Detroit to house every homeless person here? But they won't do it because it's a political issue. And um, Council, um, uh, um, Congresswoman um Talib was talking about, uh, she was bringing it to us saying that there are opportunity zones where a lot of the, the funding that the politicians have they hand over um, or um, the Congress people, they uh, have opportunity zones for like their billionaire, um, you know, um, buddies and, and certain things like that. Just like, um, it's, it's just uh, what we're finding out is it's, it's really more of a moral issue of what's really going on and how people get treated, the marginalized people, and it's not right. I live in Columbus, Ohio, and I have seen um, housing go up in some of the worst neighborhoods that um, it's claimed it's for low income or low income people or to help people come out of shelters, but the neighborhoods are very unstable. Mm -hmm. um, they often don't have good schools in the area. Um, and I've also driven through some of those same neighborhoods and seen um, what I'm assuming to be people's um, who've been evicted, all of their things out on the curb. Um, and I've often wondered, even when a person leaves a shelter and goes into a neighborhood like that, or they find themselves unable to pay their rent or unable to keep their utilities on, um, unable to have good services for their children. It's, can a case manager address that or are there any programs that currently exist to address individuals that have come out of a shelter but they're still, their housing is very unstable, very insecure. They may find themselves um, with no air condition and heat like we're having or no water because they can't pay the bill. What, how is that addressed in this, in this crisis? Well, what I can say, dealing with the case managers, um, I, I haven't really seen in my experience and, and speaking with uh, a lot of the people who were in the shelters, I haven't really seen the case managers really do anything to address those issues because as you have stated and I've stated, um, the places that they tend to put people who are homeless are in undesirable neighborhoods. Um, 
in uh, places that, you know, where you're going right back into uh, uh, inhumane condition, bed bugs and more. Um, and that, that shouldn't exist. That, that's something that can get addressed. Um, but as I had stated, when you mar you're a marginalized, treated in a marginalized manner, uh, that's the way that our society tends to feel that people need to get treated. And it's a moral issue. So I know, I would, go ahead, Anthony. Uh, I, I, would say I would agree with Adrian that it definitely is a moral issue. And, and part of it is, is how the system is designed and, and where the funding is. So I know um, that you know, there, we run rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and permanent housing programs through our agency. And all of them have different requirements. And, and I will say that our most successful uh, clients are the ones who have mandatory case management, uh, where in order to participate in the program, you really do have to engage with one of our staff who may be the clinician or a social worker um, who's experienced in the area, uh, and I'm sure Sarah can, can attest to the same thing, but that when you have that, that contact and you build that relationship and you have someone who's helping you remediate those barriers to prevent you from getting into that situation, then it helps. Uh, it also becomes a fundraising issue as well. So um, there is uh, for, for example, in those same programs, the subsidies are, the rental subsidies are pretty steady, uh, where nonprofits like ours uh, spend most of our development time is really funding the services. So where um, it's, it's relatively, I won't say easy because it's not easy, but um, it's really relatively consistent that we can find the funding for the housing subsidy. It's not so consistent that we can find the funding to pay the salaries for talented uh, clinicians and case managers who can actually do the work um, and, and not worry about their own income because you want to make sure they're compensated uh, in an appropriate fashion as well uh, and build those relationships with clients uh, so that they can re uh, remediate those, those, those issues uh, that have caused them to find themselves homeless uh, in a lot of cases by no fault of their own uh, and help them get through it. Um, it also becomes on the development side, to your point, Janet, about where affordable housing is placed, uh, that becomes, you know, you know, we have to look at our urban planners and our and our legislatures and our and our city councils of where are we designating uh, uh, areas in our cities for affordable housing. Um, you mix mixed rate projects that don't always have to be uh, in an in an undesirable neighborhood, but it's always a challenge of finding the neighborhood, finding the the right place to build these facilities, whether they be large apartment complexes or you're doing scattered housing like we do. And we do a combination of both. But finding the right place is critical because you don't want to put someone back in an environment where they're going to either uh, slide backwards or be re-traumatized uh, as well. So um, those all are, are important factors that need to be taken uh, taking note of uh, and should be addressed when placing someone in any type of housing program. Unfortunately, um, not every agency has the capacity to do so or, or the funding to do so, so it becomes a challenge. Um, how would an agency such as um, the Citizens for Affordable Housing or Sarah Circle, how would you address a person that found themselves with a roof over their head out of a shelter, but they can't find a job that will allow them to pay for affordable housing? Well. As an organization, most of the, the people who um, lived in our housing were people who were had Section 8 vouchers. And as I think this is, this is to Anthony's point, and many, many times you have the, the resources um, to pay at least part of the rent because, because we live in a, um, such an ex expensive area even having a Section 8 rent, uh, because we have uh, developed small small projects, the cost to maintain the unit just physically in terms of all the costs that um, associated with that, we had to do vigorous um, fundraising on an annual basis to support our operating budget. But um, we also, in terms of providing services, we didn't have mandatory, mandatory services, but um, we work with um, women for the most part, our units occupied by uh, single women uh, families, work with women to uh, prepare them um, for um, a better, 
a better outcome, and especially with respect to uh, financing. Um, we provide um, what we call a, a, a process called mobility mentoring, where we work with families and um, help them to decide what that is that they want for themselves and their children, and then try to provide them uh, with the tools that they needed so that eventually uh, they are in a position that they become economically self-sufficient. Because um, the, even among housing advocates, we put so much emphasis on uh, uh, providing the unit of housing without providing people with the services so that they can be in a position that they no longer uh, need public assistance of any kind. And we, and I think as long as we continue with that approach, um, we, will, we will always have, uh, and we always will have, we know that the Bible says the poor will always be among us, but the number of poor will keep increasing um, if we don't do something to provide people with more, um, with more income, frank, frankly. And of course, at the bottom of all this in this country is the, our wealth gap between um, those who have and those who, who, have, who have not. How do case managers at Sarah's Circle address that issue? Um, because as Josephine mentioned, we're talking about a problem um, that has existed pre-pandemic. I mean, people, are the homeless are typically poor people. They may or may not have a job. Even if they do, they're not able to pay for a decent home. Um, how would a case manager approach a situation like that? Well, we um, provide employment skills training and we also have um, lectures give it, come in and give trainings to the women so that they can learn new skills. Um, we just introduced our official employment services program in tandem with rapid rehousing so that as you know people are becoming homeless, they can be connected to resources to find them work um, so that they can come back, you know, recharged and ready to go and able to maintain that housing. Let's, um, I want to get to some of the questions in the Q&A. I apologize that we probably won't get to all of them. Um, here is a question about the eviction moratoria. And um, this attendee says it's, it's meaningless if they don't, if there isn't some action taken by landlords um, or or against those to landlords who are essentially criminal by providing housing that is poor, unstable, and charging exorbitant rents for those. I'm not sure that any of the programs um, that exist really get to that issue. Maybe some on the local level um, are there, is there anything any of the panelists um, might be aware of that addresses that issue? Of, and, and in the 60s, they were called slumlords. How do we prevent that? And I think to your point, it's going to be a local response. I mean, you've got, really got to look at your local housing code and, and the, let the laws that are in the state legislature and even some of the city council Councils have their own specific uh, rules on eviction procedures as well. Um, but from a federal standpoint, if you've got a landlord who is behaving badly and they are receiving Section 8 funds or any type of federal subsidy, they can be debarred from participating in those programs. So if they are continuing to harass clients, um, to uh, improperly try to evict, they're shutting off power, changing locks, um, showing up unannounced, um, and, and just really harassing and berating the, the tenant, um, they can risk losing uh, the ability to participate in these federal subsidies. And, and those landlords like those subsidies because they're almost guaranteed money. So um, there may be some slow processing times, but if you're a Section 8 landlord and you're receiving that voucher, you're 
probably going to get your money on the first of every month. Um, but if they, want to, if they want to continue that from a business standpoint, and I, and I go that way because a lot of these landlords could care less about the, what their tenants have gone through, what their trauma has been, or why they found themselves needing affordable housing in the first place, but they're still business people. So they want to make sure they can pay their mortgage and, and how are they financing their rental property. So you hit them in the pocket. So, and that's what I think is probably the best way to, to, to do it. Uh, in some jurisdictions, like in Baltimore, depending on your behavior in Baltimore County, you can be criminally convicted as well or criminally prosecuted. So they really um, should, uh, and to Adrian's earlier point, it is a moral issue. You know, you want to treat people with respect regardless of their ability to pay and, 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 and their income, um, but they, they still deserve, they're still human, and they deserve to be treated like a human. So if you, if you can't appeal to their good nature side, you can appeal to their pocketbook. And so if, you can, uh, if their freedom can be jeopardized or their, their ability to earn is jeopardized, I think that's how we'll have to really uh, push uh, uh, landlords to be good participants in these programs if they are receiving those, uh, those subsidies. And if they're not receiving the subsidies and they just uh, have sub substandard housing, that really falls in the local jurisdiction to make sure their inspectors are going out and that they really are enforcing the housing codes that are already on the book. And I, I would add to that, since this is a forum um, put together by lawyers, that people have legal recourse. And in most um, communities and cities, there are legal aid attorneys, um, many of whom particularly focus in the landlord and tenant um, area. And so I would encourage people um, to, to be in contact with those organ organizations. Now, again, everything is really local. And you know, in some areas you have a strong um, legal aid organizations and in some, some you, may, you may not have um, for, for various reasons. But Janice, something you, you began with, which I thought was uh, interesting and I wanna comment on, um, talking about people who give money to organizations and sort of what the, um, maybe what the role of donors are with respect to the organizations that they assist. And I would say that we, people who want to be generous um, from a financial perspective should also care and watch the organizations to whom they are giving funding to see if those funds are being used wisely. And if they not, they're not, then they should um, cease or even or better try to influence the organizations. And people can volunteer to serve on boards, the directors of nonprofit organizations, serve as advisory council. There is a way all of us can be involved in making the world a better place and, and to get to the, the moral issue that Adrian now keeps uh, um, making reference to. Housing is a, should be a human right and we should all care whether people are, are being housed and we should give our money, we should support legislators and we should be engaged, directly engaged to the degree that our resources and, and time allow us. That's a very good point. Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad that you raised that point. Um, there's a person in the Q&A who um, says that they were incarcerated for a number of years. Um, they've been released and they are attempting to re re-enter society. They initially had housing through through a landlord that was not providing decent housing. They're now in a program called the Step Up Program. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. They're in very nice housing. Um, it's very costly. And um, the, they say that the program will provide rent assistance for about six more months. And after that, they're not sure they will be able to make enough money to afford to live where they are living. 
I know um, you've mentioned lots of requirements depending on the funding for these various programs. Most um, have some kind of requirements. What does a person in that situation do um, when the, there is a limited time frame for being in a program after which they are not prepared to, to place themselves in affordable housing? Well, most, most people, not most people, people, if they find themselves in a situation where they have limited resources, um, I would recommend that they always look to see if they can get on a waiting list um, at var various types of waiting. There's Section 8 waiting lists, various programs have their own waiting lists. And put yourself on as many waiting lists as you can. Sometimes it takes forever. Uh, sometimes the people have waited seven or eight years, but after seven or eight years, for some people, the, um, the housing voucher um, comes um, becomes available. And it's, you know, and hopefully, if someone does get in a situation where they do have housing, that, that they are making, um, making themselves available to get job training or to be involved in something where they're going to um, expect that there's going to be um, an, an increase in their, their rent over, over a period of time. Okay, anyone else? Um, Adrian, is there anything um, that you're aware of in Detroit um, to address an individual situation such as that? Um, where he found himself where the program, the, the fundings were um, uh, limited and he wasn't ready to get himself in a better position. Correct. Um, me personally, that's why myself and a, a several people, we were talking about trying to start up our own um, uh, shelter because we were so dissatisfied uh, what, what was going on. Um, there has to be programs implemented and put into uh, shelters um, where it can empower people also. Um, even me personally, I would create like entrepreneurship programs um, where people don't just have to rely upon what going to a job that possibly they can get laid off of. Um, do uh, have like brainstorming classes, uh, bring entrepreneurs in um, to talk to, you know, the people that are receptive to wanting to become an entrepreneur and learning, you know, um, many, you know, avenues that they can take um, to address some of the issues going on, you know. I think that what each of you has made clear is that the problem of um, finding a home is it will affect other issues in, a, in the life of a family. It will affect their mental health, their employability, their um, ability to take care of their family. Um, I have heard that the current um, secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, Secretary Marsha Fudge, believes that there is a crisis and that part of the way to address that crisis is through the various um, pending infrastructure um, legislation. Do you all agree that this crisis is in need of a federal response in addition to a state and local response and that the current responses need to be at least updated and, and a, a new, we need a new approach. We have section eight vouchers, we have several other programs, but um, the problem needs a new approach. I would, uh, I would uh, agree. I don't, I'm not sure that I would say it needs a new, new approach. 
I think the real issue is resources, um, whether it's vouchers, universal vouchers, or whether it, it's more money to create, cr actually create units of units of housing. I think you know we've all seen to recognize the importance of the services, but the housing has got to come first. That's the foundation. Um, with respect to the infrastructure, um, my understanding is that the the agreement with the Senate that the Senate has come to does not include housing as infrastructure. I know um, Representative Walters is very um, is putting forth her own bill with respect to um, having um, funding for um, in her what she's calling her infrastructure infrastructure bill. Um, so. I don't know, you know, in the short term, I don't think anybody knows. I think we're all hopeful that between the various funding that's coming from the federal government, and the federal government has to be a, um, sort of the leader on this. There's no way any local or state um, can has the resources to address the problem at any place, uh, at any state in, in the United States. Um, I would like to say um, when also when Myself and uh, the organization that I worked with in the past, Detroit Action, when we had a meeting with Congresswoman Cynthia Johnson, we had um, asked her to um, create a bill um, for people who are going through hardships to at least, ex you know, allow them at least five years or so um, where they don't have to pay like their taxes or um, like you have people that uh, elderly people have had homes and their families for generations and they become ill and they end up losing their property because they're not able to pay certain bills and that's why we had asked her could she create a bill to allow some type of wiggle room you know for the person um, to to get a chance to get back stabilized again and she she was for it she says that she would do it um and i mean there's there's a lot of things that um everyone needs to come together and brainstorm on. But I do know that there are some, you know, some good solutions if people just work. Well, obviously 90 minutes is an insufficient amount of time for us to address all of the issues involved in affordable housing and housing insecurity. We um, thank all of you, each of you, I should say, for taking the time to share your thoughts and and to talk about some of the, the programs and efforts you are making in this area. One thing I think um, we all agree is that there is a housing crisis, an affordable housing crisis, and we appreciate your efforts in attempting to address those issues. And we hope we have given some of our participants some thoughts about how and some concrete ideas about how we can all become involved and address this crisis. My name is Janet Green Marbley. And as I mentioned, I'm in Columbus, Ohio. I am a member of the ABA uh, section on civil rights and social justice, and I've had the privilege of moderating this very knowledgeable panel. Um, I appreciate, again, um, the time that you've spent to, to speak today. I appreciate all of our participants for joining this webinar. Um, I'd invite you again to take a look at the website to look for and to participate in other free webinars offered by the section on civil rights and social justice. And we thank you for your time this afternoon. And Janet, speaking of time, I, I think we have some time left. I may be wrong, but uh, I think we still have about oh. 20, uh, almost 30 years. It, it's, it's, it hasn't been that long yet. I think we've only been on it for about an hour or so. Oh. Unless I missed something. If I'm wrong, please, someone tell me to uh, sit I'm down. I'm sorry. And be quiet. But, um, I'm sorry. I think you're right. 
I'm on George, a, that was just a commercial. You just gave a commercial. Okay. That's, <laughs> That's my commercial. Um, let's go to some of the Q and A. Um a a question or here's a question in the Q and A. We've had several PBRAs here in Texas which have gone to court due to habitability issues caused by landlords not maintaining their properties. I'm not sure what PBRAs are, but hopefully some of you will know. People were, were and some still are living in mold and vernon infested complexes, no access to clean water, etc. Under Trump and Ben Carson, the AFFH was considerably scaled back. AFFH needs to be aggressively enforced. Any updates on this? So a PBRA is a project-based rental assistance project. So I actually have okay. two of them, uh, I say we have two of them here in Baltimore. And what's different from uh, Section 8 and from some of the other programs like HOPWA or Shelter Plus Care, some of the home funds that is that your voucher is tied to a very specific unit so you get approved to move into that apartment and you're in that apartment until you qualify for like a section 8 voucher and you're able to go somewhere else or to other permanent housing so it sounds like the our our, our commenter is referring to some of those projects that they just haven't been maintained from a property management perspective which um can can be for a number of reasons sometimes it's the construction sometimes it's, it wasn't a good rehab um, and, and, and let's not forget, I mean, I, I'll speak now, I'll put on my developer hat now, my property manager hat, that it's still property management. And so one of the challenges that, that we experience is that, um, and, and it's one that I have had to become um, more empathetic to, is that we are housing those who are the most vulnerable in society, who often don't either don't have a rental experience or haven't uh, rented and uh, had a lease in their name in, in quite some time. Uh, and really still don't know how to maintain an apartment. So sometimes we have to deal with tenant issues. There are other issues as well. So it's a combination of, of issues that you have to deal with if this is the space that you want to operate in as a developer and as a property manager. With that being said, we still have an obligation to make sure that we provide safe, healthy housing, uh, regardless of, of what's going on with our tenants. So I think part of the, the issue is, is, is getting, uh, if you're going to run a project-based uh, uh, operation is that you understand your clients. So uh, it, it really is uh, upon the property managers and the developers to understand what trauma-informed care means. Uh, I think there was another question uh, and suggested in the group of what, what role does supportive housing play, and, and that's the point of supportive housing, is that you really are, are coming with a trauma-informed approach. You understand that you don't want to re-traumatize someone, you meet them as they are, and help give them the wraparound services they need uh, that Sarah's talked about as well. It's workforce development. It's coordinating uh, their resources so they are getting their proper mental health and health treatment. Um, I firmly believe that housing is not, it, it, it's not only we have a housing crisis where we don't have a, an inventory of affordable housing, but the lack of housing is a health care issue. That there's no way you can take care of your mental health or your physical health if you don't have a stable place to live. So a lot of times, uh, and to, um, when you look at time-limited programs, the challenge is, depending on where your client is coming from, if you tell them, hey, I, I, we're going to cover you for three months, that probably isn't enough time to get them at a point where they're stable to move on to other permanent housing. So it should probably go from a, uh, from a shelter, and normally it looks like this, this is a trajectory of how it works. You go from a shelter to a transitional program, and then from a transitional program to a permanent housing program, and then you can stay on that voucher or whatever that funding source is until you can uh, afford market rate or move re reunite with family or some other type of permanent housing. But it's a step process that you have to get to. No one's going to be, if you've been incarcerated for 20 years and you come home, you're not going to be ready for permanent housing after six months of release. You're not. You just won't have uh, the understanding, the skill set. You're still getting acclimated to your new normal. And so the, the importance of wraparound services to the question from the group is that that is the point. They are there to provide that support, to stand in the gap between that person and the rest of society because when they're walking down the street, when they're going into an interview, when they're going into a government office, that person behind the counter has no idea what they've experienced. And the person, in, in, in this case, our clients, typically don't have the experience to understand how to deal with that, 
Um, and so you have to work with soft skills like anger management, time management. Uh, you may have child care issues, unemployment issues. Uh, sometimes you, you have to start from scratch, but we're really helping people get their first driver's license, locate their birth certificate, find and apply for their Social Security card. I mean, that really is, when people come into some of these programs, you're starting from that level of what supports do they need. They need the very basic um, to, in order to understand what it means to live independently and, and, uh, and as you move forward. So it's really wraparound services are critical. Case management is critical. Uh, we try to, uh, at our agency, to incorporate uh, mental health services with clinicians as much as possible. And if we can't do it, we refer them to and help them, and in some cases drive them to other providers who can give them the help that they need. But that is critical, that you're not, um, that the, the answer to homelessness and the housing crisis is not just to only build more housing. Because if you do that and you don't do anything to treat the whole person, they're going to end up homeless again. There's a question um, that addresses the prevalence of HCV home ownership. And the question is, why is that so rarely utilized in particular um, since it seemingly builds wealth directly into the hands of the homeless? I'm sorry, John, I didn't hear the very first part of that question. The um, type of home ownership is referred to in the question as HCV home ownership and why it is so rarely utilized. Oh, is the HCV, you think that maybe they're talking about the Housing Choice Voucher Program use? Oh. Well, I don't, in our community, um, we have a housing authority, but they don't, they don't use um, their vouchers for that program. I don't know how, I know some housing authorities do, I think that um, it, there is a relationship between, a basic relationship between how much money someone has um, and sort of, sort of speaking to um, Anthony's uh, is, issue in terms of, of services, to be a homeowner, there are certain services, certain um, skills that you need to have and people need to be um, made aware of that. And in, in Massachusetts, at least, they do have housing counseling, um, first time home buyer programs, and they have a housing counselors who are um, associated with those programs and people have to, to uh, take the classes and earn a certificate. And then um, the state does have, um, some mortgage assistance programs. But I think it, frankly, it's a, the rare person um, who can afford to go from being a, a voucher holder and move into um, home ownership because it, owning a home brings a lot of costs um, beyond paying a mortgage. And I think sometimes people are not really aware of that. Um, and they get themselves into situations that um, they find that they, they can't maintain the home, which I think going back to 2008, when we had all the, the crisis that we had in uh, home ownerships and people losing their homes was directly related to people um, becoming homeowners when they weren't prepared to be. I, I have a question. Um, I'm not sure who might be able to address it. Some years ago, the city of Columbus and I think the state of Ohio established an affordable housing trust. What, um, what exactly are those organizations and how do they work? And do they provide any of the other services, the wraparound services, I guess, that um, are necessary in, in getting housing for people? Well, Anthony, you wanna take that? Sure. Um, 
typically they are uh, both. They are um, local uh, funding dollars allocated to affordable housing, both rental and for uh, home ownership. So um, it's the, the local way of providing, you know, a pool of funds, normally either through some type of tax structure or donation or fundraising, maybe with the local found, uh, philanthropic community that will provide additional housing or additional, additional funding on top of state and federal dollars. So this is when you will see those jurisdictions really stepping up, providing local funds to uh, help rectify the problem because uh, a large portion uh, of the funding co does come from the federal government, then the state government, and in some jurisdictions there just there just isn't any local governmental funding uh, available unless they create an affordable housing trust uh, like we have here in Baltimore. It was created a few years ago, like you did created in Columbus. But but for that, uh, the housing authority for that city may be involved, but they're typically just a pass through for federal dollars or for state dollars. So they'll they'll get money from the local housing authority will manage the the city's allocation of Section 8 funds, but not really providing city dollars to the problem. So when you create an affordable housing trust, you're now looking at local funds that are adding to the available resources for uh, housing in that, that jurisdiction. Thank you. Um, I think I heard you, Sarah, mention a, a rehousing program, a rapid rehousing program. Um, how does that work? Yes, yeah, so people um, are sent to us from the city, um, people that are typically newly homeless, and the goal is to um, have them on the process to being rehoused within 30 days. Um, now, the tricky part is you can't just take the people that are newly homeless through this program. So we've been having some of our regular clients applying to these units through this program as well. So it's not a perfect system uh, because everyone's gonna have different needs based on the program that they're going to, but um, it is something we've implemented and we've seen some success with. When you say regular program participants as opposed to new applicants, what does that mean? People that were coming to Sarah Circle pre-pandemic versus people that found themselves homeless due to the pandemic. And Sarah Circle is um, specifically targeted for, uh, for women and children? Just uh, unaccompanied adult women. Unaccompanied adult women. Do programs um, like that exist in the city of Detroit or um, were you able, Adrian, to get into any specific programs targeted for victims of abuse? Because it seems like if you're not able to fit neatly into one of these categories we've mentioned, the mentally ill, a veteran, an abused um, woman, um, or, or youth under a certain age, there, then you kind of fall into a gap, a homeless gap, and there may not be any funding to specifically address your, your issue. Well, see, for me, um, when I, I fled domestic violence from um, my ex-husband who was well-connected, he's a doctor, and I found myself once I got into these places that he was um, connected with a lot of these people, even in the safe houses. We were never safe, me and my children. I had to file three PPOs against him. Uh, the chief judge that was um, somehow knew him um, covered up a lot of crimes and, and obstructed justice. So I myself, when I tried to go get help with uh to the, uh, went to the FBI, the Justice Department. Um, everything fell on death's ear once they would, I guess, contact their contacts in the system. And for me and my children, we never got any protection, equal protection under the law or fairness. You know, and I'm the type of person, if I see something that's not right, I'm, you know, I'm going to speak up on it. And that became an issue to the point where a psychologist told me, he said, um, you're trying to bump the system. I said, no, I'm trying to get help and address the problem. 
He said, no, the system is working as it should work. He said, you're trying to bunk the system and people that expose what's going on end up in trash cans. So that was my issue. What I, you know, went through with my children where we didn't get any fairness. Um, I even certain safe houses said they didn't have enough room for my family. And we, you know, we weren't able to, to go to the different places that we needed to go to. So in my individual case, which I've met other women that went through similar, um, there was just, um, there was injustice that went on and happened. No one cared to do what was right. So I'm, I'm, we've got the problem of the lack of sufficient homeless shelters and space and shelters in addition to the lack of affordable housing for those who are prepared to move into and, and move into a home and get a roof over their heads. I know this is probably true in most cities in the winter when it gets very cold, there are no beds left in most homeless shelters. Um, the two problems are, are similar in terms of the kind of, of people served, and that is typically low-income people, but once you get ready to come out of a shelter into a home, then you face somewhat different kinds of problems. Ken, um, how do your agencies address these problems. I know for Anthony's agency, you're targeted to the AIDS population. Um, what if someone either doesn't want to disclose their health issue or they don't have that as an issue, but yet they are homeless, they're searching for affordable housing? Yeah, so as we've expanded, we um, have changed some of those requirements. So now um, I mean, our roots are, are in the AIDS epidemic, but you don't have to have HIV or AIDS to secure housing through our agency. Uh, you can have any, a disability of any type that has to be verified through a physician or a mental health provider, um, or again, through looking at one of the other categories, category one or two or three, if you are a transition age youth between the ages of 18 and 24 and you meet one of those definitions, depending on which project we're talking about, and when I say project, I mean which uh, physical building because each uh, one is built with a certain funding source and that funding source dictates uh, what our requirements are. So um, it's one of the things that my team has to do on intake is that we get the full application and then we then determine based on what the person to your point has self-reported if they qualify for any of our programs. So um, if they don't want to disclose their HIV status but they do want to disclose the fact that they're suffering from depression and they have a note from their doctor to say that, they would qualify under our Shelter Plus Care Grant as being having a disability and can get funding that way. Um, but if they do disclose later, then they open themselves up to other funding as well because we do have, uh, again, depending on what you do, we have, we have 17 different funding sources. All, some of them are subsidies, some of them are case management. So when you, depending on which box you check, that's, let me know what available resources I have for you if you fit the categories for that for that program. Uh, which goes back to my earlier point: if you are a uh, if you're over 20 if you're between 25 and 49 with no mental health issues, you don't have HIV AIDS or any kind of disability. There's not there's not much, and you're not a veteran. There's not much out there in way uh, by way of a, a large national grant or federal grant that really is gonna provide a subsidy for you. You really have to rely on your local giving community. Um, it sounds like something that Adrian is trying to start, right? Some, uh, feel, you have to find people who are um, innovative enough and have the resources to fill a gap. So if you can fill that gap, then that's a place for you um, as, as a nonprofit, Adrian, or for anyone who's interested in, again, or they have influence in their state, local, federal legislatures. There are gaps in the system that need attention um, and, and that's what I think uh, Adrian experience and what I know Sarah sees as well. It's one of the worst feelings uh, you can have as a nonprofit uh, provider or service, human services provider when you have to tell someone, I can't help you. There's nothing, based on my limited funding and my restrictive funding, I don't have the resources to help you in your situation, which I know is traumatic and critical for you right now. I just don't have the ability to do so. 
and, and, and those are probably the worst moments you can have when you really have to, and, but that's the only message you can give other than, hey, have you tried other resources? But sometimes um, they don't exist. And so, again, I would ar- uh, urge anyone who's, uh, who's listening uh, who has an interest and a passion for this work and a passion for their neighbors and, and really want to uh, make an impact on society and, and to help, find a way to fill a gap, I think, because there, there are enough out there, so we don't need to overhaul the system. Let's just fix the one we've got. Thank you, Anthony. Um, there is also a question in the Q&A that asks about racial disparities in affordable housing and in some of these services. Can any of the panelists address that issue um, and, and what can be done to rectify it? I was um, reading an article today about the chronic, or sorry, the coordinated entry system, which um, evaluates people who are homeless um, based on their vulnerability scale. And then based on that number that they're assigned, they are placed higher on the list for housing. And of course, when you don't have enough housing, you're just moving people around and around and not really solving the problem. We're trying to shrink the problem Um, or yeah, trying to shrink the problem. So something that really stuck out to me was the um, gender and racial um, inequities in this system of vulnerability measurement because of the history of um, distrust with medical providers um, between black people and their medical providers, they're less apt to go to a doctor. So that is one of the ticks on the vulnerability scale. You know, how, how many times have you been to the emergency room? How many times have you sought emergency services? And these are things that are more highly prevalent amongst white people, white people or white women. Any other racial disparities, Josephine? Yeah, now I, this goes back to one of the, the questions that was asked earlier, and we only dealt with the f- first part of it. The person asked about AFFH, um, uh, which stands for Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing. And any Um, locality, jurisdiction that receives federal funding for housing has an obligation to to make sure that the fair housing laws are being um, um, complied with. And more than the jurisdiction has responsibility to do even more, that we actually have to take active steps to determine um, whether or not people in the community are being um, denied opportunities to housing because of of discrimination of any kind. And there are federal fair housing rules. And then um, in Massachusetts, we are lucky. Uh, We not only have the uh, federal rules, but we have state rules and one of the largest areas um, that is not covered by the federal fair housing is the a source of income, which means that uh, Anthony had spoken before about the um, security that comes with someone having a section eight voucher. But in many communities, um, landlords will not accept section eight vouchers um, and especially for families because they don't want to um, um, abate lead, which old buildings usually have, and they don't want to take the, on the expense. And the other thing is that they don't want to have to go through the annual inspections that um, the voucher requires, which is speaks to one of the, some of the issues that um, Adrian was speaking to about the condition, the poor conditions of of, of housing. So um, the person who asked the question mentioned that um, the previous administration had altered the um, actions that actually had come from the Obama administration to really enforce fair housing. 
Um, and they, my understanding is right now that HUD is about to come out with a new rule with respect to um, furtherly, further affirming um, fair housing and that there's going to be comment period, I think, over the next couple of, of months or so. So if people are concerned about fair housing and about racial disparities, um, there's an opportunity uh, to, to comment on that. Thank you, Josephine. Um, everyone has been um, impressed with, well, a lot of people in the Q&A have been impressed with the comments given here today, and in particular with Adrienne's sharing of her personal experience. One of the questions asked, um, is there a way for you to share that experience on Capitol Hill and actually seek action by Congress um, in addition to your local elected authorities and your representatives, but have you a plan or any of your, has your advocacy included um, going actually testifying before the Congress in support of some legislation to address homelessness in America? Um, I would love to do that. I know um, myself, my daughter, and a few other people from different states, we made a film, a video called Lawless America. And um, for some reason that, that video got squashed. Um, <laughs> I guess certain uh, local officials didn't want it to get out, but um, I would love to do that, you know, because I'm all about trying to make things better and helping people to live their best life um, as everyone should be able to have a chance to do. And I think also that we need to address creating a bill of rights for um, homeless people in the shelters so that people do not get abused uh, continuously by staff members and higher ups for their failure not to address serious problems. There are um, a number of resources listed in the chat, uh, links to resources available for those who are interested in following up on the issues um, dealing with um, homelessness and housing insecurity and affordable housing. Um, those links might also be available on the website for the civil rights and social justice. So we encourage you to take advantage of those. Any closing comments? Now I know I can tell time. <laughs> um, I apologize for the first time. I would blame it on my watch, but it's my on my phone. So those are always correct. Um, but now we are down to about um, two minutes. I'd like to invite any of the panelists to make any closing comments at this time that you would have for our participants. Yes, I, I would encourage people if they are interested um, in, in this topic of um, homelessness and housing uh, insecurity or, or stability, that they should um, look at what's happening in their local legislatures and in the national legislatures and become involved by sending letters to your um, legislators um, and um, if you're so inclined, write up ed pieces because the housing um, crisis in the United States is, at this point, it's more, it's more than a crisis. Um, we have a generation of children. Um, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about children today. We most things seem to be focused on single individuals, but we have children, a generation of children who have grown up homeless and we really need to um, recognize that and be doing whatever we can in our own communities. Sometimes we focus too much on the national picture and don't focus on what's going on right around us. And 
I would encourage people to look in your own community, see what is happening with respect to housing for everyone, but especially for the children. And, and I would add, after you do that and you identify the problem, you can look outside your community for some benchmarking for other creative solutions to bring something to your local jurisdiction. But definitely uh, get involved, um, find a way to, uh, to make an impact uh, and pay attention to what's going on. All politics is local, so your city council, uh, the elections are critical. Your, your mayoral elections and, and your gubernatorial elections are critical. Um, and, and look at those appointments that those folks are making once they are in office. Who, is, who runs the housing board? Who is, who is your housing commissioner in your city? I think so, knowing those appointed roles and, and making inroads with them, um, if you're passionate about the work and you care about your neighbors and you want to make an impact, start to get, take a look at the lay of the land and who those players are and, and really start to um, you know, organize and to really use your voice, speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Thank you, Sarah. So I would say, you know, um, get hyper local boots on the ground advocacy because someone mentioned in the Q&A about NIMBYism and that is a huge deterrent for affordable housing. Owners coming out and saying, not in my backyard, but on the when it's someone else's neighborhood, they're all for it. So be the change you wanna see in the world. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anthony Butler, Josephine McNeil, Sarah Nutt, and Adrian Tynes, again, for your time and your expertise in this issue. We appreciate each of you joining us today, and we hope you will continue to participate in the various webinars sponsored by the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section.